Yay! Yay! It's a very happy Feedback Friday this week. And why am I happy? Because people behave themselves in YouTube comments this week. Yes! You guys did it! Yay! Go team! The comments were civil. And there was good discussion. You notice I even, apply, uh, I even replied to, to some of them. Uh, because it was civil. Oh, good God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, there were a couple idiots, but, you know, mo there was good discussion. And out of that good discussion came a follow-up topic. And, and these are the glorious moments that I live for on Feedback Friday when there is dialogue. Wonderful, wonderful dialogue dialogue where the conversation advances funny that funny that that people can actually have a civil conversation without resorting to name calling and nastiness and then justifying that nastiness with more nastiness but i digress just just yay round of applause good job guys good job go team now the the follow-up comment i got multiple um, comments about perpetuating this idea that Gone Home is not a game. And people backed up their argument that Gone Home is not a game based on the fact that it doesn't have a fail state. Now, the thing about game, the definition of a game, is that there are multiple different ones, uh, definitions of what a game is floating around. So there's no right or wrong answer in terms of what a game is. The thing about video games is they're not just games. And that's where the, the explicitly ludic definition of game for the purpose of video games falters in in my opinion there are a lot of games that don't become games if you're too rigid with something you know the idea that well it doesn't have rules every video game has rules guys they're coded just because you can't see them in something like gone home doesn't mean they're there and i don't like these ads here now I'm going to I'm going to zoom up because I don't like having those up next things. I prefer something because people watch these on phones. So there, that's better. Um, but you know, every game in a virtual environment, every application in a virtual environment that you interact with has rules. The the exception that proves that rule is some of the stuff I've written in the past where people use video game technology, video game engines to create simulations for things like treatment of PTSD. The reason why I say there, the rules stipulation is removed there because a technician changes the simulation based on the feedback from the, the person undergoing the virtual reality therapy. So instead of having a locked in set of conditions that you have to deal with, you have to navigate, you can change the rules as you go. You can say, no, there was a car there, there were birds flying overhead, or, or there was a sound over there. You're, you're altering the reality as you go. In something like uh, a game, like any game, like Gone Home or, or whatever, the the rules, the parameters with which you can play, not just the ball court, not just the sandbox, but the things you can do in it, the items you use in it, your time frame, how you interact with those objects are all defined by the software. So there are all rules. There are rules even if you can't see them. So the idea that Gone Home is not a game, it has no rules, is false. There are rules, and I showed you some of those rules. You can open the pizza box, but you cannot pick it up. You can't flush a Bible down the toilet. The, these are all rules in terms of parameters in a game. So yes, there are rules. One of the goals of AAA game design, modern AAA game design, is to try to make those rules as invisible as possible so it is an immersive experience. The whole idea of minimizing ludonarrative dissonance uh, is 
the idea that you want to make your rules so intuitive, so natural that people aren't seeing the rules. And that's a unique thing between video games and, and conventional straight up games. So that's the first thing people said it, as again, I'm not saying you're wrong per se. I, I am pointing out how this is a complicated issue. Okay. The second thing people said is that Gone Home is not a game because it doesn't have a fail state. Now, go ahead and subscribe to that theory if you want. But then you also have to recognize that there are other games that also do not have fail states. So according to that logic, they're not games. Journey is one of them. Mist is another. There's no fail safe in Mist. You can't die and have to start over. The original Bioshock has no real fail state. You're constantly respond in those, what are they called, vat chambers? I don't know if I'm confusing them with Fallout, but you don't die and lose progress. You're not reset to a checkpoint. You're simply moved to a different point of the map. You, you lose an ammo clip. So it's more like a penalty than a fail state. And you know, then you go out, the creatures have lost no damage. You pick it up right where you leave off because some game designers believe dying disrupts the narrative. So they're deliberately not putting fail states in, in the game. The fail state in a game is a failure to complete the game. That's a natural fail state, okay? And, and it is. If you rage quit and give up and never complete the game, you failed. And that's true of a lot of games that we assume a pass-fail state for. It is possible to not complete Gone Home. If so, you failed to complete Gone Home. It might have bored the crap out of you, but you still failed to complete it. So this idea of artificial fail state in video games not only doesn't apply to video games, it doesn't apply to some games in the real world. There are non-competitive games that you can fail to complete, but you don't exactly lose. You know what I mean? Like this idea of a fail state is not as simple as, as people make it out to be. And that's why I like to examine this idea that Gone Home is not a game. I mean, so other people pointed out that you can't die in Minecraft. You can't die in L.A. Noir. There's really no fail state in L.A. Noir. L.A. Noir branches. Heavy Rain is another game that branches. There is no flat out you lose the game or you cannot complete the game. And that's why I think that this not a game thing is not especially helpful when talking about video games. We need to loosen the game because we have this interactive component as well. And if we're too rigid in our definitions, we're missing out on some very interesting experiences we would otherwise not be able to partake in. You get what I'm saying? Like, just because a developer decides to change the rules and hide a fail state doesn't mean they're not there. And, and more and more developers are including the act of playing the game with the game itself. They're, they're trying to blur the lines between reality and, and the, the simulated world. And I think they have every right to try to do that without people uh, revolting because the rules are too rigid. And that, that's very important when we, when we talk about, because don't forget, we have games as games and then we have games as art. And I mean, The Walking Dead, there's no real fail state there. But, you know, things branch things change, but there's no die, start over. I mean, one could claim that anything with a checkpoint doesn't have a true fail state. You don't have to start all over again. You're not failing, you're backing up. So this, this fail state argument, I, I think, is rigid. And while it's not wrong, it's unhelpful. You know, the other thing somebody said is that Gone Home has no mechanics. And this is this armchair issue we get into with the you know the princess bride factor of games what do you mean by that it means you keep using this word i do not think it means what you think it means mechanics are not gameplay elements mechanics 
are the things you can do in the game. As I pointed out in the comic, I said, you can pick up items. That is a mechanic. You can open doors. That is a mechanic. WASD, like keyboard and mouse controls. That is a mechanic. Mechanic. You can't have a game without mechanics. Okay. Mechanics are just how the game works. It's like saying it's a car, but it has no parts. So what... What people I think are actually saying when they say it has no mechanics means there are no active game elements in Gone Home. It's more of a simulator, which actually isn't true because there are some puzzles. You have to enter codes to get into locks. You have to uh, open secret doors. These are all established gameplay puzzle mechanics, okay? And so we have to be careful when we're throwing about these, these technical terminologies that we don't actually impede meaning through jargon. And that, that sounds very mamby-pamby and, and, and philosophical, but it really is true. When you limit developers in, in this, it's not a game, which is you know kind of a gaming equivalent of no true Scotsman. You know, no true game would do this. The, the reality is that Games are a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And, and the one thing that was interesting, made me think for a minute, is somebody made a definition. They said, okay, maybe Gone Home's a toy, but it's not a game. And that's interesting. And, and so I'm like, okay, what can I apply it to? Well, if you have a doll and a house and they're just sitting there, that's not a game. You could define the act of, you know, playing house, playing around with the dolls and, and, and doing that as that's a game. It has parameters and it has a specific activity. Now, some would say that's play. That's not a game. But that to me, that's really splitting hairs because I don't know if you've seen some kids with, you know, what we call so-called unstructured play. They set their own rules. No, you can't do that. They do this or no, that's not, you know, they kids start creating their own structure and that's that's an exceptionally important form of play but rebranding the idea of video games as video play well that's just a waste of time and you know th this is i i, I want to be clear i find this very interesting you know i said off the top people i was like yay respectful dialogue so i don't want anybody to walk away feeling like i'm saying you're just wrong and you're stupid and all that no i'm not saying that at all i'm saying interesting points raised i'm not trying to refute the opinions expressed here i'm trying to give you food for thought trying to explain why it's not so simple to say something has no mechanics or no rules or no fail state. Um, and, and that's the wonderful thing about games, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the sheer complexity of video games and seeing how developers choose to attack a particular element of game design because there are so many ways to do it and because there's so much choice, you know, that is very compelling to me. And I think the, the, the reason we call them video games is because they, they do have that limited parameter in some way. They either come in a box or you download a file and it does a specific amount of things in a specific amount of time and it's not reality and nothing really functional comes out of it. I mean, that's, I guess, the difference between gaming recreationally and an e-sport. But sports are still games, right? So to say, well, nothing, nothing useful came out of it. Well, if somebody got money for playing a game, that the lines blur, right? And that's the whole point. The glorious thing about video games is that um, it exists in a perpetual state of blurred lines. And I don't mean that song. But if, if you want to imagine a blurred lines video game, you go right ahead with those goats and naked ladies. Um, but that, that to me has always been the joy of video games is it, it exists. And, and I, I go back to my, yay, I love this element. The intersection point of narrative and game ludic component is the part of games and, you know, tabletop games and, and things like that, that fascinates me. 
it fascinates me. And yes, some games are more story than game, like Gone Home. Some games are more game than story, like um, oh, Super Meat Boy, for instance. There's or Mario. There's there's the bits of a story, but unveiling the story is not the the main point of playing those games. It's a platforming challenge, and that's what's amazing to me. You know, some games sort of have a combination, but when you think about those those great action adventure games like you know Uncharted or God of War or something like that, they're relatively flimsy from a traditional game with rules um, element. I mean, yes, there's certain places you can run and certain places you can't. Although you know games like um, Assassin's Creed try to elim try to eliminate those artificial barriers as much as possible. They keep pushing forward and forward more and more as much as technology allows. So, you know, that that whole idea of things you can and cannot do, I mean, you could say that the weapon selection is a rule, but that's try to emulate reality. So do you see how it becomes very difficult? And like I'm not saying that Uncharted and God of War aren't games. God no, they're absolutely games. But I'm saying that all these games our games. And th then we come to this idea of, well, if it doesn't have graphics, it's not a game. And this isn't the case of Gone Home. This is the case of, you know, one person brought up Depression Quest. And oh God, I'm really hesitant to talk about Depression Quest. So let's broaden it. Okay. Based on that, Zork is not a game. What's Zork? You're likely to be eaten by a Gru, you know, way back 1970s. Just because something has no text doesn't mean it's not an interactive adventure. I mean, you can die, so it has a fail state. So the people that say a, a game has to have a fail state to be a game, okay, then Zork's a game. But people who say Depression Quest is not a game because it has no graphics, well, then neither are those old classic adventure games because they were just text. There were no graphics. It, it was too rudimentary. Then there's this whole subset of games for the blind, that don't use graphics because they can't see them. Does that mean it's not a video game or an interactive game, as people say more and more? Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. I think these boundaries are artificial and unhelpful. If you're using it as an interesting thought experiment, then fine. But if you're, if you're limiting your experience, if you're not giving something a chance because it doesn't meet your expectations of a game, then you're just limiting yourself. You're, you're not limiting what game designers can do because game designers are going to keep pushing those limits and we want them to. We don't want them being afraid to take risks because somebody will say it's not a game. Now, this gets very complicated in the case of a game like Gone Home because it did receive such incredible praise. And a lot of people feel like that praise was unwarranted. And I talked about this a little bit, but I want to talk about it more because people did bring it up in comments and this is going to be the last thing I address in this video. As I said, the, the problem is back in the day with film reviews where there were no aggregate services, you would read the review in your local paper or your magazine or the little thing on the radio, and it would be a thing in isolation. It was a subjective opinion by a subjective reviewer that either you agreed with or you didn't agree with. And I know there are some people where I read the review and go, oh, this person hated it. I'll probably like it because I think this person has no sense of humor. Aggregate services like Rotten Tomato and Metacritic changed that. And I'm, I'm constantly at war with myself over these aggregate services because I look at them out of curiosity. I'm not sure how influenced I am personally by the number. Now, I know that, um, you know, there's there's people that are influenced by the numbers and unfortunately people's paychecks are influenced by the numbers and that's when I get really bothered as a as a person who's a creator myself because I know 
from being subjected to the review process. Some people just don't get it. Okay. I mean, I, I, I had a book out. Uh, was it last year, this year? I don't remember anymore. It all blurred together. The ebook was out last year. The, the, the tree wear copy was out this year. And some people really liked it and gave it a very positive review. And, and some people didn't get it. And then other people didn't get it, but liked it. And I found that the, the score, the three out of five, the four out of five, whatever, mattered less to me than the actual reasons given for that score. And it was because, you know, all right, Publishers Weekly liked it, but didn't understand it. So thank you very much, but that doesn't do me a lot of good. You're, you're, you're not an informed reader. And I see that happening a lot with game reviews. I mean, I'm watching the reviews come in for King's Quest and often I'm like, did we play the same game? And something games are subjected to through the review process that film and TV aren't is that we have sort of a double issue in terms of classification. There is the game, the type of game it is, shooter, adventure, action adventure, RPG, strategy, etc., but then there are the, what I call the, the, the adjectives, the genre, we would call it in film and television. And ding, 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 Leanna's soapbox, we need better tools for video games. Because genre of game is, you know, in a book, it would be mystery, uh, adventure, uh, romance, things like that. You know what that means. Genre in video games is a two-pronged thing, right? It's an, it's a puzzle mystery. Okay. But then puzzle is the type of game, right? Mystery is the flavor. But now we're one degree removed from the way film and television, uh, sorry, film and literature are approached because by then we'd be done. It's a gothic mystery. It's a gothic romance. It's a gothic adventure. It's all still gothic. It's a gothic mystery. It's a steampunk mystery. It's a modern mystery. It's an urban mystery. It's still a mystery. Games are much more complicated. So we'd have a, a post-apocalyptic mystery is another one. But let's stay with gothic. We have a gothic horror survival RPG. That's far more complicated to have expertise in. And with something like King's Quest... You have a medievalist comedy episodic adventure game. There are very few people under a certain age that understand the core adventure genre enough to really analyze King's Quest as an adventure game. So people start getting comparative. Like, it's kind of like The Walking Dead. It's kind of like medievalist fantasy games. It's kind of, kind of, kind of. No, adventure is an established video game genre that has its own rules. And the minute I see a, a review that says, well, it's boring. Things don't happen for a really long time. Anybody that's played those adventure games are like, that's the point. That's like complaining in a shooter that bullets are flying all over the place. Adventure games often... You, there are points that you can die, but more often the, the fail state, for lack of a better term, the challenge in an adventure game is getting stuck. So going into an adventure game, you should expect to get stuck every so often and, and wander around and, and try to figure it out. A game should not be criticized for this natural part of its genre. It's just like survival horror games tend to be hard and they often have animal hoarders and you die a lot. Should we criticize a survival horror game for being a survival horror game? No, it doesn't make any sense. So criticizing an adventure game, because it is an adventure game called, you know, the, the, we're, we're basically saying to get Shakespearean, an adventure game does not retain its perfection if you don't understand the title. And that's ignorant, isn't it? There's no point in reviewing a game if you don't like the type of game. So don't review adventure games if you don't like that wandering around flailing because you're stuck. Don't downgrade the game 
because you don't like the type of game. But we're seeing this happen over and over and over again. And then with King's Quest, it's too easy to dismiss it as, well, I just don't understand the nostalgia. It has nothing to do with the nostalgia and everything to do with the type of game it is. And you, you can't expect to approach an adventure game the same way you approach a shooter. A shooter is constant action. An adventure game has lulls. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a different pace. And this is a problem with games. And, and this is why I have supported the people who, you know, in, in one various form or another, have caution people are protested against the state of modern game reviews because they're too rigid. Just like I was saying, these definitions of games are too rigid. And again, soapbox time. Um, we need our own tools and we are borrowing review processes and review terminologies from film literature and television and not being fair to games because we're doing comparative analysis, not native analysis, you know, and we need tools. We, we need, we need game reviewers who are game reviewers, who are not, what the heck happened? Um, who are not people who, you know, learned the process of reviewing through film and then jumped to games. No, 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 no. You know, you don't start, checking people's eyes when you have a degree as a podiatrist. You just don't. And it's the same way. TV and film are not the same. And it drives me crazy because there are so many films that are two-hour television episodes right now. And this is a topic for another time, but it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy because TV, it doesn't even have the same monetization model as film. And we need to, and, and this is a respect issue, and I think that's why people get so upset about it. It is a respect issue. We need to respect games as games and not treat them as kind of a book, kind of a TV show, kind of a movie. We need to get over this pejorative that Hollywood loves to use, film reviewers love to use. Oh, it's like a video game when they talk about movies. Fuck yeah. That makes me more likely to see it because that means stuff will happen. And we need to respect our games. And we need to come at the review process and the criticism process and the analytical process and the marketing process and the community process and every process surrounding games needs to come from a place of love and respect. Because if it doesn't come from a place of love uh, and respect, you're no longer a critic then you're a hater. But we have no haters here this week because people were respectful in YouTube comments. And I'm so ridiculously happy. Have a good weekend, guys. Thanks for watching.